Good morning. This is Jason Dean coming live at you again on a Saturday at about eight or nine eighteen Saturday morning. It's a warmer day. Uh, yeah, crazy weather patterns. It got warm, snow. It was snowy for a while. Got cold, then it got warm again. Now got, and then it got cold again last night, and now it's a little bit on the warmer side. But hey, that that is life here. Uh, you know, on this planet Earth uh, for 2023. So, hope everyone's doing good. I want to thank everybody again for, you know, supporting this channel. And, you know, the, like I said, two of my favorite things, or my favorite thing to do, is uh, are the interview segments that I get to do on this channel. Uh, I really love... Having guests on the show, I try to, you know, I try to have people who have been or are part of the film industry to some to some capacity. I've had one of my favorite guests that I had was my one of my best friends, Sean Russell, who is a a musician and composer. He's worked on a bunch of short little films, documentaries, and he's done uh, lots of film scores and uh, scores for television shows. And we did a show last year, way back when, and, and it was uh, it was fabulous. And, and I've had a varied degree of other uh, people who had a couple of guests on the show that were uh, a actually actors or are or, or actors in the industry. I had Lydia Manson. She was my first guest I ever had. And that was back when I was just doing the Facebook Live shows. And we did an interview through Facebook Live. And she is a an actress in the kind of the, the modern indie horror world. She has like tons of different projects going on all the time. Every couple of weeks... I check out some new things that she's doing and it's pretty amazing for it being, you know, kind of the part of the underground circuit, how prolific she is. And she's always doing uh, all kinds of projects. I know she started out as an actress in various really low budget horror films. And then she moved into producing uh, certain films also. And she's kind of a mover and shaker. And she was a, she was my first guest that I have uh, that I had on Film Fanatic, and that was back when I was doing just mainly uh, stuff around my Facebook page, and I started doing uh, on my own. I started doing the live reviews, and then it led to the idea of trying to have guests on the show, and so that was that was a great time. And I had another group of guests that I had on the show, and since I've you know made that big transition to, to really kind of the main focus now for all things in the film fanatic world is this YouTube channel. I'm really enjoying it. I love the the way it's set up. I love uh, the ability to kind of control things a little bit more. And like I've said too, I've been really excited and fired up by people having an interest in a lot of the videos that I do, particularly around the more obscure films in the, you know, horror exploitation world and the giallo world. I try to always bring a variety of different films. I love all styles, you know, everything from foreign films to suspense, action movies, big budget, you know, sci-fi action movies but my jam and my my passion, my love uh, that I always always have gravitated towards as a kid, but even more so now is the you know the the CD world of what is known as horror exploitation. I just there's just something about it. It's just so uh, it's just so great. I'm just like attracted to the I don't know the trashy nature of those films. But you know again I love all kinds of things, but I try to make the focus of that focus of this channel to be on those kinds of, of, of those genres 
just because I love to, you know, maybe, you know, someone out there who might come across my channel who, you know, who has a real love for, for film or, or in particular, they might particularly really love horror and science fiction. So they might want to, you know, take maybe a deep dive and maybe they'll come across a movie uh, that's really obscure, that's something they've never seen. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they're they willing to take that ride and check that out. Recently, I just had a, like, I just got in a conversation with a, a new subscriber. And he said that, like, he, he came across my channel, you know, pretty randomly. And he started checking out a lot of the videos and quite a few of the movies he had never seen before. And he really appreciates the work that I'm doing, trying to, you know, bring bring a little bit of light to a lot of these obscure movies. And I thought that was really awesome and a really nice compliment. And so that's kind of the, you know, um, I don't know, the whole focus of this channel overall is, is to, to try to bring those kinds of things, the more underground films and things that are, you know, uh, that a lot of folks probably have never seen, including myself, because there's a lot of films that I've been buying without... You know, not really knowing that much about them. So it's been pretty awesome. And that is the focus of this channel. And going forward, that's going to be, you know, continue. That's, that's, it's going to be a continuation of that. So I really love that. And I love that there's, you know, there's a bunch of other film fanatics out there that seem to dig, uh, kind of the, the seedier side of uh, of film history. So, super cool. Other And like I, I was talking about other guests I've had on the show, I I had a, a really great guest, Ray Leone, who is actually uh, a, a drum student of mine. I, I play music and attempt to have a music career, but I also uh, teach a little bit privately. I give drum set lessons. I have... I've been teaching drums for quite a few years. I started out teaching drums about probably probably like 11 years ago. And up until that point, I I didn't really have an interest in teaching drums and I didn't really feel confident in doing it. It was something I never really thought about. I had a couple of friends and and also other musicians that I was playing with that were that were doing it and a couple of them were doing it full time and they were able to make that almost their sole uh, source of income you know in between gigs because gigs can be pretty sporadic and you know you can have seasons of where it's very busy and then seasons uh you know because we live in a seasonal place here in Maine you can have areas of time where there's not a lot of work and there's always kind of like a you know, an ebb and flow to that. Not, it's not, it can, it can, you know, being a musician too with, for, for getting work, you know, you're, it's kind of, well, it's a hustle. So you're, you know, you're, you're trying to put yourself out there and network and all those kinds of things. But because of the nature of that, of the, of this, you know, the, the business side of what musicians and myself, what we do, there isn't always, um, you know, a consistent uh, paycheck around it. So it's not always, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not structured a lot like, say, a regular, you know, say, quote unquote, like uh, normal job, if you want to call it that, like where you, you know, you have a fixed schedule, you go in from like nine to five or whatever, and you, you know, you have your weekends off or you have to work weekends, but it's a fixed schedule. You get that guaranteed pay paycheck. And it's consistent all the way through, all year round for the most part. With musicians, it's a little bit of month to month, day to day sometimes, week to week, you know, as far as work. But I've noticed during that time, like I said, 10 to 12 years ago, I noticed that there were some people that I knew that were teaching. And I was like, wow, like, that's pretty cool. Like, that's a whole other thing. I I never really thought about. For, for a long time, I thought... The only way that 
you know, a musician could be like maybe, uh, I don't know, reach a certain level of success or be able to have a, a pretty sustainable source of income. And kind of the only way to do it was around uh, gigs, playing playing shows, playing parties, and playing clubs, or going on the road, and all those kinds of things. And also doing uh, session work, you know, where you, you're on call to record on various recordings. And even that isn't always consistent. But I always thought, okay, it's only that, that must be... You know, growing up as a kid, when I went to school and looked toward, looked up to a lot of people that were doing it, that were older, and people that I knew that were more experienced that I got a chance to play with, I felt for a long time, well, maybe that's the only way to to kind of be, you know, to have a little bit of success in this, in this crazy music world uh, that we that we live in. <laughs> but then I realized, oh, there's actually, you know, there's actually lots of different things that a person can do, and, and that included teaching, you know. So, and it expanded to other things of where, oh, of course, gigs are a big part of it. But then there's also, you know, a lot of a lot of guys are doing that. I know guys and girls are also doing. Uh, they've invested in building their own studios, so they're, you know, they're they're doing production work for other people. Also, they're producing people's tracks. They're Sending tracks back and forth to each other, they're actually going in person and recording, uh, uh, you know, recording, working on people's albums. They're doing, uh, you know, uh, work for different theaters, providing the music for for that, teaching uh, to various degrees. And I don't know. It's it's a funny funny time because I know anybody in the arts, like it's generally a very hard way of life in a lot of ways as far as sustainability and with all of the you know uh, crazy things that have happened in the last few years and especially for people in the food you know the service industry and in particularly around musicians you know obviously there's been more challenges than ever and you know also with the whole way people buy music now and access music. But in a lot of ways, even though there's, you know, with everything, it's always, there's different shades and there's, you know, there's there's good, there's pros and there's cons, there's good there's, and there's bad aspects. Overall, I kind of almost feel like it's a little bit, there's more opportunities to a degree for, for, for musicians to, um, to be successful, I feel like there's there's more avenues to explore. So it's it's interesting. I think there's a balance of that, but I think in some ways there's a little bit more of of a variety a, a variety a variety of ways that musicians can can uh, you know be creative, put their content out there, or be involved with other artists and make money. Where in in a, in a you know while also wearing different hats, you know, whether it's production, live, in, in the live setting, running sound, all kinds of things like that. And I know a lot of musicians now that are doing that, they're, they're, you know, they're doing, they'll do some gigs where they're just running sound for, you know, if they have a pretty good sense or they have decent equipment, they'll go and they'll just run sound for an event or they'll, do the typical gig thing all their all their all the other thing is obviously they'll they'll teach whether it's online or in person they'll do uh production uh you know with the in the comfort of their own home for uh for studio projects um you know there's there's commercial work commercial uh you know uh people who who do uh like say uh, jingles, you know, or things for uh, for ads. So I don't know. There seems to be lots of different things now that are open, uh, lots of different avenues. But it, it, it so it's interesting. But so about ten or twelve years ago, I you know I didn't really have an interest in teaching. I thought it would be really cool. I was really fortunate, and it's something I believe in a lot. Uh, I I in my in, in my years growing up as as a musician, 
I was fortunate enough to, to study with lots of different teachers, you know, from all different kinds of backgrounds. And, you know, I feel like without that background, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that I've been able to do and, and whatnot, even though it's small potatoes, I feel like I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of these things. But around 10 to 12 years ago, I started having a couple of people call me and they were I uh, about inquiring about, about lessons and drum lessons. And these were all high school kids. And there was a period where I had about, you know, I had a handful of students and then it led to me teaching more. And I wasn't really proactive in that department as far as trying to solicit. But people were calling me and I and then over a period of time, I had a pretty good amount of students and they were all mostly high school kids mostly beginners and uh, you know it was a really great learning experience because I always feel as a musician myself you know that line of say the teacher student role for me is like it's kind of blurred to a degree because I feel like I get a lot out of it too in, in a way I almost feel like I'm being taught lessons too because I have to stay up on a certain kind of curriculum to stay up with you know to stay on par with where the these students are going you know and, and also at their various levels whether they're a beginner at a big you know say a beginner level or intermediate or you know occasionally students who are pretty advanced most of my experience has been around uh, people who are uh, very new to the instrument uh, so but I would always get a lot out of it because I would have to examine where I'm at and realize, oh, wait, I'm not really quite working on this or I, I'm i really rusty in this department. So I have to like practice and I'd have to like, you know, try to put together a, a curriculum or some kind of plan for the following week. And, and I found myself always doing that. And then eventually I started teaching. I taught a little bit at a at a music store for a little while in Belfast that uh, was called Belfast Music. I, I taught there for about a, a year or two had some students there, but mostly my experience was just kind of teaching, you know, here and there on my own. You know, I had always had a, a little group of students. At one point I had a lot of students, but but it was always kind of like through people calling me and and those kinds of things. And, and it was really great. I learned a lot and I always learn a lot. And then eventually I started teaching at Bay Chamber Music. And that was, that was, that was probably the biggest experience for me and one of the biggest eye-opening experiences. And and now it's kind of more of where I'm just kind of teaching at a lower level, uh, but enough to where it keeps my brain going. And I teach just privately now. Uh, I have a handful of students. So one of the students I have, Ray Leone, who I just met this past summer, super cool guy, um, such a character, we were talking one day during our lessons about film, and I had mentioned that I have this film cha film page, and then I, I just started. It was right around a time that I started pushing and doing more of the YouTube, uh, this YouTube channel. And I said, "Yeah, I really, you know, I love all kinds of movies, but horror and science fiction, you know, the whole exploitation world is my favorite." And then he 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 had alluded to the to the his his experience as an actor, and he worked on all of these. Uh, you know, independent horror films. And I was like, wow, like, that's really cool. So he he told me about them, and I made a little list. And he said, yeah, a lot of these films are available online. So I checked them out, and I was like, this is awesome. This is, like, totally my jam. So he was a guest on the show, and we talked all about that, and it was super fabulous. And, uh, you know, it was great. And then I had a my last guest was Spencer Roulard, who is a really talented guy. Who I also just met this past summer. He has this incredible group, Method for Madness, who we're actually playing with tonight. If you're in Camden tonight, we're going to be playing a show, Quantum and Method for Madness, at the the Cedar Crest in uh, Camden, right on Cam, right on Elm Street in Camden, Maine. It's going to be an eight o'clock show, and there's a tavern that's attached to the Cedar Crest Inn. It's called the Gypsy Rose Tavern. So we're going to be doing a, uh, a show there. At eight o'clock and tonight and method for madness uh it, it's just tremendous music that uh spencer creates and it's this modular synth stuff 
And we did a show because after getting to kind of know him for a while, you know, uh, we've played together a couple times gig wise and got to know each other a little bit more. And we, we realized we have a lot of commonality as far as our interest in film and also our inspiration that we take from movies, movie aesthetics, and particularly around movie soundtracks and composers in, you know, in that respective field. So we did a show just about that, and that was really awesome, um, really, really cool. Um, so, And I'm doing another show today at 1 o'clock with this woman named Kaylee, who is the manager at Flagship Cinema in Thomaston, Maine. Really excited about that. We're going to talk about, you know, basically what it's like to keep a theater, a living, breathing, breathing theater afloat in this day and age when you're competing against uh, all of the streaming platforms that are available, like, you know, numerous. So it's going to be, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see and hear, hear her perspective from, from say, the, the financial side of that and what that looks like, you know, that, that perspective. So stay tuned for that show. That will be a blast. And that's, we're going to be recording that show uh, today. So the two biggest aspects of this channel that I love are, you know, is the, the interview segment. So stay tuned for the show with my guest Kaylee from Flagship Cinemas. I'll be posting that uh, probably probably tomorrow or so. I usually it takes me a little bit longer to post the videos for with the interviews because I gotta you know check it out and see if things go went relatively smoothly uh you know they, or that they go smooth uh you know uh, or they're presentable i should say you know or maybe i have to do some fine tuning or edit them edit the videos or maybe have to redo them and i think they've come out pretty good i'm learning as i go uh, as far as that stuff goes but so i usually wait a day or two to kind of sit through it check out the video and all those kinds of things and then i post it and stuff so um and the other thing that I love is I love people commenting on these videos. That's been really great, inter, you know, just interacting with other film fellow film fanatics. And like I said before, the, one of the biggest things or biggest changes for me as far as my buying habits for film films in general uh, is to like take chances now and buy movies that I haven't seen before. I used to, when I started buying movies pretty regularly quite a few years back I would typically only buy movies I, I had seen before uh you know growing up as a kid or in passing I might like I you know for instance I might have seen like a, a brand new movie that I really liked and then you know maybe a few weeks after that or a month after that I would usually seek out that movie and sometimes I'd make little lists and then I would buy it on Blu-ray or I should say DVD because at that time I wasn't buying Blu-ray. I've only been buying Blu-rays now for um, probably about three years. It's pretty new. Three or four years. Or at least pretty heavily. I was kind of late to the game. I didn't really want to go into the direction of Blu-ray only because I, I didn't want to have to like buy, you know numerous copies of a film I already own because I already have tons of DVDs and, and also VHS but so I was kind of late to the game but then I realized that quality and that uh, it's just you know, equal to none and uh, so I just went ahead and did it and I realized it's been the best thing ever there's also 4k and 4k requires more of an update or an upgrade because you have to get a specific TV for that a 4k TV and who knows, that might happen. That that might happen down the road. We'll see. Uh, you know, because I know the 4K thing is supposed to be even better and even a higher resolution. I have seen 4K. I've seen a couple of movies in 4K, and it is it is kind of insane. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to rule it out at this point. At one point I was because I'm like, ah, I don't have to like... You know, like for instance, uh, one example of that, if I was to go in that path, would be one might say one of my all-time favorite movies is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I have like probably like five copies of that movie, just that movie alone. And I have 
I have a VHS copy of it, I believe, and then I have two or three versions of it on DVD. I have like a standard version, and then I have this anniversary collection, and I have a special, a special edition version of it, a steel case set, and then I also have two Blu-ray copies of it. So if I was, say for instance, get if I was to move into 4K, that would definitely be one of the movies I would seek out, and that would so then I'd have to buy another version of that. So I'd have like six versions of the same movie, and there's a lot of movies I love, so that might mean having to have like you know ten copies or whatever of each movie, which is kind of crazy, but you know I don't know, it might be worth it. One good thing about that is that each each edition I do have is very different than than the previous one. So I don't know. There there are various versions. Some have lots of special features on you know included, but but the my habits have changed a lot now. Where now I buy most of the movies I buy now are films I've never seen, and usually I come across a lot of these movies because of you know case one example would be, say, uh, one of my all-time favorite directors is Lucio Falci, for instance. One of the greatest directors ever in the horror exploitation world. Other directors that I really love, uh, Bill Lustwig. So, like, take those two directors, for instance, you know, they that were just masters, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the world of horror exploitation. And I love those, those their movies to death. So I'll like watch them, but then I'll come across, you know, uh, you know, while I'm maybe checking out their movies or maybe doing research or reading about them as directors, I'll come across a bunch of other movies that came out that uh, around that same period and other directors that are similar in style or part of that, you know, so-called genre. And that opens up these this this whole other thing of these whole other avenues or like other gateways to tons of films and tons of directors that I, that I'm not familiar with. So I've been transitioning in my own habits to try and explore that world more. And I've been doing that. And then also over time, I've been really, uh, I've become aware of a lot of these great uh, companies that are reissuing a lot of these grindhouse movies and exploitation movies. You know, Severin is one that I've been really watching and buying a lot of their films. Uh, Blue Underground, Mondo Macabre, um, so many great companies, so many great companies. Uh, Synapse is another company, uh, Vinegar Syndrome, um, just so many. I'm, I, and I know I'm probably leaving out a few, but there's a ton of different companies that are kind of specializing in releasing or re-releasing a lot of these totally obscure movies so now when i'm shopping i'll usually go that helps that definitely helps me now as far as making uh decisions as to as to what i'm going to buy and the prices for the most part are really good some are pretty expensive because they're collectors they're rare you know and uh but prices have dropped even on those those packages like say you know there might be uh you know uh, for example like a dario gento movie uh or say even a well, for example like a lucio fulci film where now you know at one point like as far as a film that is considered to be a classic in that genre and it might be a, like say a collector's edition a lot of those films are like twenty eight twenty nine dollars for one disc which is expensive but I've noticed that those prices have come down a little bit and a lot of the times taking that plunge is worth it if you're a fan of these films because they come with so much stuff like you know usually they're there's always a bonus disc they come with the maybe the the soundtrack or there's um, you know, hours of special features, interviews, and there's documentaries. And that's one thing I've noticed about buying a lot of these packages and a lot of these Blu-rays is that it's just, you know, it's it's a 
film education you know it's just awesome so i've been so i've been doing that and and like i said the 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 you know quote unquote bo boutique labels that are you know putting out these films that are really rare but they're very uh revered in the kind of underground circuit and sought and very uh sought out they tend to be expensive a lot of times they're worth it they're worth buying and i'll i've been buying some of the more expensive ones along with the cheaper ones like Mondo Macabro is one, one label that I really love. One of my favorite labels. They're really cheap. Their films are all really cheap. And they really specialize in uh, tons of obscure movies. Tons of movies I've never heard about. But their prices are fantastic. So I've been buying more of their films. I mean, Blue Underground is just really great. Severin tends to do a little bit more of the higher level uh, boutique collectible uh, movies. But they do just a fantastic job there i kind of feel in a lot of ways they they might be the best in in a lot of ways just because of the sheer uh, amount of material you'll get with a movie with all kinds of documentaries and all this stuff so a lot of times it's worth it so i bought a movie i was in uh i was in portland uh yesterday and on the way back i stopped at bull moose in brunswick Brun and the brunswick shop where Bull Moose is, uh, or Bull Moose is, is located in Brunswick. They have a bunch of different locations, but the the Bull Moose the Bull Moose in Brunswick is a is a smaller shop, but it's great. They have a really great uh, movie selection, and in particular around the horror uh, Blu-ray selection, and they have tons of great um, exploitation movies. They have a really great uh, combination of different things. If it was a little bit closer, I would probably go there. I would go there more often. For me, it's about an hour. They're about oh, an hour and fifteen minutes, hour and ten minutes. It's a half. They're like half a half hour from Portland, and Portland is about just just shy of two hours from here. So it's a haul. But if it was closer, I would go there more often. But there's times where I'm down in an area a lot, so I'll hit that place up. But anyway, so yesterday was a perfect example. I, I picked up a bunch of movies. I picked up a few movies that I had never seen before. And and I watched this movie last night. And, and I was in I was in the shop about it was around um, Christmas time. I think that was the last time I was down there in Brunswick. And I kept, and I was, there was one movie I was looking at, but I didn't buy. I ended up buying these other movies, but I didn't buy this one. And I almost bought this one, but I'm so glad I did. And I, I, I was there yesterday and they had it. And that's this movie here. Dracula vs. Frankenstein, 1971. And I just watched this last night. And I have to say, this is now officially one of my all-time favorite movies. I've like I've talked about it before, you know, sometimes when you watch a film for the first time, whether it's like at home, like on DVD or Blu-ray or especially in the theater, it's a funny process. Sometimes you like right away you're just like you know, you're totally into it and you're just like this was awesome and if if you especially if you go to say a theater and you go with some friends or a friend and you see a movie and you have that experience where it's like, wow, you're excited and you're talking about it. And then you keep talking about it the next day and you just like automatically are a fan because it just hits you in a certain way. And then some some other films where you go and they're not very good. You know, you have that experience and they're kind of trash. Or you watch a film over a friend's house and you have that experience, you know, either way. And then there's certain films that you watch you watch them and you're like, yeah, that was good. That was solid. I really did enjoy it. But then the preceding days afterwards, you you're um, you find yourself thinking about that film more and more. And before you know it, you're talking about it and you're you're like, and then suddenly you're like, wow, like that was an awesome experience. Like that was really good. And then. The other part of it, too, is sometimes you see a film and you're like, yeah, this is really good. I liked it. I had a good experience around it. It it, 
it was a good you know quality two hours you know um and and i enjoyed it but then maybe the next day or 24 hours go by or a couple of days and then you just kind of forget about it and it just every that whole kind of uh resonance that you had with the film just kind of dissipates and you're like uh, i don't know it was kind of and then you forget about it this was a movie dracula vs frankenstein this movie i was so excited by this movie this movie is just amazing uh i'm so excited that i bought this film this package is just incredible uh i mean look at this artwork just amazing i never heard of this film i saw it in the store about a month ago and it's from 1971 and i have to say this is like one of the best uh horror exploitation movies i've ever seen uh in my life i just this movie is just so so incredibly bad and so incredibly cheesy and so incredibly magical all at the same time the effects in it are just completely ridiculous and but just so amazing and it's so campy it's so trashy it's so low budget but it just has this like like I, i'm a like i always talk about one of the biggest things for me that sells me that I'm when when a film has it I'm usually sold on it even if it's like a film that isn't very good maybe the story is kind of a mess or you're like wait what just happened uh with these characters or maybe the the direction is bad or the editing but if it have the film has this this like uh kind of real tangible tactile atmosphere I, you know, particularly around the ex in in the exploitation world, I I I'm a fan. I'm I'm hooked, and I'm I'm like this was a great experience. I want to see this again. I want to experience this again. Even if all those other things, all those other elements aren't there, it's like no, it's just got this this certain kind of flavor that I just dig, and it and it had that. And this film has that. I mean, the atmosphere for this film is just incredible. Uh, it's so pulpy. And it's so trashy. It's so low budget. Uh, and it's a, actually a good story. The acting is really good. Uh, and it's terrible at the same time. And this package that I got is just incredible. This was a little bit more of an expensive package because it's got two movies on it. I'm going to watch the other movie uh, either tonight or tomorrow. And that's called Brain of Blood. And, and on the back of this cover... It's got of the slipcase. It's got the artwork for that, and it just looks unbelievable, like unbelievable. And the packaging for this is just incredible. Um, I mean, this is the original artwork for the film, for uh, Dracula vs Frankenstein, and it's just it's amazing. It's amazing. It's got two discs in it uh, that are just amazing. There is. And this this was released by Severn. And like again, I talked about Severn being probably overall probably the best company around just because of their the sheer content that they that they put on their on their movies or, or the the content that they include with their movies and the quality. They're they're a little bit more on the expensive side, but they're so worth it. Like this this I started watching, I got through a good portion of the the special features on here and they're just tremendous there's all these amazing interviews with the, with with the filmmakers the actors uh it's just awesome and but there's hours there's like hours of this stuff plus it, it came with two movies uh and i you know and again i can't believe the music is just great the other thing that's so awesome about this film is that it has a bonus disc of the soundtrack this other disc in the film in this package that that comes right here is the uh is the soundtrack for this film and i was just like yes that's one cool thing too i've come across the last few months is like certain movies i've been buying they come with the soundtrack uh one of my favorite probably my well probably my favorite lucio fulci movie of of all time is house by the cemetery and i just love that movie so much and that that disc, that DVD, that, that Blu-ray 
edition that I bought, was, which was a collector's edition, came with the soundtrack. And it's just amazing. It's, it's just so awesome. And so when I bought this, uh, actually, when I, I didn't realize it until I came home and I opened it up that it came with the soundtrack. I didn't realize it. So I was like, oh, yes. So awesome. So that's always another thing, and I and I notice that's a thing that Severn does. I haven't seen it really with any other companies so much that that do that, that include the soundtrack. That and again, that's one of the allures. And for me, like personally and musically or artistically, if you want to call it that, the music for these films and the uh, the aesthetics, all those things are the you know the the biggest influence for my band Quantum. So I'm all about that, especially if I love the music. One of my other soundtracks, one of the other soundtracks I got when I bought the the, the Blu-ray was uh, from this, ama- this amazing movie called Pieces. That came with the soundtrack, and it's just it's just incredible. Um, and so Dracula, Dracula vs. Frankenstein came out in 1971 just mind-boggling how old this film is it's almost like you know it's like over 50 years old but it's so kick-ass and it was directed by al adamson and apparently like i've never heard of al adamson but apparently he uh you know he was known as an exploitation director but he also did all of these like really sh- like other films that were monster movies essentially but they're all like really schlocky and they're all like kind of like exploitation version versions of the Universal Monsters. The other thing that is so cool about this film is Lon Chaney's in it, which I was just like, yes. And Lon Chaney, you know, one of the most iconic horror actors of all time, played the original Wolfman. And Lon Chaney, you know, during that time of, you know, when the Universal Monsters, you know, first kind of premiered and first came out, you know, you know, you, it was like, the public's introduction to the iconic monster uh, movie and these iconic monsters, you know, Frankenstein, uh, Dracula, uh, the werewolf, uh, the mummy, the invisible man, the creature from the Black Lagoon. These were all like iconic monsters uh, that Universal, the, the, the big giant studio, have you know have basically cr- created and and adapted these characters from various novels you know with say with Dracula who was famously played by Bela Lugosi that was all adapted from Bram Stoker's famous novel and that was like the first kind of one of the first incarnations you know and obviously the first would would have would be the original Nosferatu but this was like kind of the first like commercial uh you know introduction and then Boris Karloff who famously played the Frankenstein and of course that was adapted from Mary Shelley's book which is an amazing book i i really love the original novels about uh, uh, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and also Bram Stoker's Dracula. The, the original novels, like the books, are just amazing. They're a little bit more compli- complicated. They're like more, there's a little bit more depth to the characters. Um, but, and they have a little bit more of a, uh, a depth to them. But they're just tremendous books. Like, it's amazing. But so Universal Monsters, you know, or Universal Studios, you know, basically put these monsters on the map. Uh, and Boris, so you had, you know, the most iconic, act, you know, actors that played these monsters were, you know, Lon Chaney. Or Lon Chaney Jr. played the Wolfman in, you know, in, in many, many movies. Um, you know, there were there was a whole slew of, uh, werewolf movies that he was involved with during during that period, and and I would say pretty much Lon Chaney was the, you know, kind of the the first and 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 the the first kind of iconic figure to play the Wolfman. So, 
And then you have Bela Lugosi, most famously, uh, you know, his role as Dracula. You know, just iconic. He he went on to play, in you know, he was he was an actor in many many other horror films for many years, and most notably Dracula in his in his roles as Dracula, and then also Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein for many years, and also was in very uh, many many other horror movies, and he also played the Mummy. He also uh, brought that to the big screen for the first time. So many, so many great films, so so classic, and this version of the film is basically like the exploitation version of that. Where, and the one thing that's really different from the Universal monsters is not only, I mean, they're iconic and they're amazing, and I and I have pretty much have all of them on DVD. I have a few of those movies on Blu-ray. One that I really, really want to get is. As much as I love Frankenstein and the classic monsters and Dracula and the Wolfman, I'm overall I'm more of a when it comes to monster movies, you know, where you have like people who are really into vampires or people who are really into zombies or people who are really into say werewolves. My favorite monster or monster, you know, uh, monster um uh uh, we call it a franchiser or my favorite iconic monster is is really anything and everything attributed to the wolfman or or werewolves i i love werewolves even more uh than any other monster i'm i'm a huge fan of all of those other monsters in the universal world you know really really i'm a big huge fan of 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 dracula and vampires but for me, I don't know. I, there's something about the the essence of werewolves that just really uh, I find just that more stimulating. Just because there's a you know there's obviously areas of the around say the essence of what vampirism is or vampires and also werewolves are where they're kind of steeped in reality to a degree. Like there are aspects of our personalities and traits as, uh, that we are as humans that cross over to that and there's like a, a lineage and there's like a little bit of a realistic kind of uh, uh, base around it but for me it's like the werewolf thing is 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 that aspect I feel like that really is a reflection of kind of the human animal and that to me is just even more tangible or even more interesting, like that dynamic. So I've always been a huge fan of werewolf movies. Those are my favorite styles, uh, my favorite monster movies. My favorite werewolf movie of all time is The Howling. But there's so many great ones. Um, but this rendition of, you know, where it's there, it's all about this battle or this fight between Dracula versus Frankenstein is is like the exploitation version of it. The, the like the Universal films that came out in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and even the Hammer films that came out after that, which are definitely more schlocky and low budget to a degree. The one thing that's very different about those films, like say the Universal, you know, films that those iconic movies compared to say these these kinds of films like the exploitation films is that like the universal movies are very, very serious. They're meant to be kind of taken real literal, like they're, they're meant to be taken literally. They're very serious. Um, and for their time, they had a huge production value. You know, they were made in, you know, they were made 60, 70 years ago, whatnot, but they, or even more, but they had a, at that time, like these films were, uh, you know, there was a lot of money put into them, a lot of care, a lot of love. And they still hold up. I don't think they're they're really dated at all, but they were considered to be kind of highbrow films, and they're they're they were meant to be taken seriously and meant to be, you know, to a degree taken in a literal sense. Whereas, like this film, for instance, and and some other monster movies that I've seen that are kind of the exploitation version of it, is these films are way more way more low budget, first and foremost, way more low budget. And, you know, the acting skills of the actors in these films is, you know, is not, not as good. Um, they were shot in a quicker, 
in a very sh- in, a, in a much shorter period of time but they also are way more campy and they're they they're way more silly they have this real pulpy vibe to them they're way more sleazy uh but they're i feel like watching this film like when you compare say watching the original bell lugosi version of dracula or or the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein, where those movies are seriously, are like take meant to be taken on, 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 in a very serious light. This is like no, is is completely the opposite. Where no, this is like a party movie. Like this is like silly, and we're kind of laughing at ourselves while we're making this movie, even though it has some really great uh, horror elements and it's and it has all those tropes. It's it's meant to be taken really light, and it's like super funny and super hilarious. Uh, but just amazing, and the soundtrack, everything about it, is just is just fantastic. And again, I had never seen this movie before. And apparently, from reading about this film and and these films, they were both directed by Al Adamson. And as in from from what I've just been learning, just within the last few days, is Al Adamson was like a you know, a really well-known exploitation director in the '60s and '70s, and he made a series of these movies that were like totally, like these exploitation movies that were like schlock versions of these bigger, bigger budget films at the time. Uh, so I'm really excited to watch uh, *The Brain of Blood* because that's another one of his films that I've never seen. And but this movie is just amazing. It, it stars, like I said, Lon Chaney Jr., who is just awesome in this film. Al Adamson, he's actually in the movie, who's the director. The guy, the actor who plays Dracula is just fantastic in this movie. Xandar Vorkov, he plays Count Dracula. There is, there's a, uh, an amazing interview with him in this film that is just so entertaining. Uh, just so great. So great. Um, and again, it's a whole new experience for me. The other actors in this film are uh, Regina... Is Regina Carroll and John Carroll Nosh, who plays Dr. Frankenstein in this film, John Bloom, who plays Frankenstein, and Anthony Esley. John Bloom, who plays Frankenstein in this film, uh, is just so awesome. He, It's really odd because this film, and I know this came out way before, but or a few years before Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but there's something about this uh, characterization or rendition of Frankenstein that really reminds me of Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like the way, I don't know, it's something about the whole like design of his makeup and uh, the way he's he's a huge guy. He's like almost seven feet tall and he's this like monstrous guy. But he just has this like kind of crazed thing about him and like he's unhinged and uh, lots of things and traits that I've always have felt that the character of Leatherface really kind of, you know, portrays really well. Uh, and then, like, certain level of vulnerability, and he's kind of, uh, you know, in, inside he's kind of, uh, you know, with especially around Leatherface's character, where he inside he's he's like this, you know, really terrified child, but on the outside he's, like, monstrous. Um, so there's, like, always that kind of you know, uh, I don't know, tension between, uh, you know, with his character. And also there's like an androgynous uh, kind of vibe too, where he does like wear women's clothing. And so there's like that. So I, when I watched this film, that was one thing I, I thought about was like, wow, like he, he, I wonder if when Toby Hooper was putting together, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he and I, I was wondering, like, did he see this film, which he probably did, and did he like look at that as being an influence because this came out in '71, and Texas came out in '74, so it's a few years. So I was curious, like, I wonder if Toby Hooper saw this and kind of based some of the ideas for for uh, for Leatherface around this rendition of Frankenstein. Because there's a lot of similarities. It was it was really wild, particularly around just the way, uh, the, well, especially around the makeup and the way the face and the makeup uh, and the hair was was designed, and also the way he carries himself. It, it it's pretty awesome. 
But my my God. So I, after I watched this movie, I was just totally blown away. And now I have to say officially, this is on my top top five. Uh, it's in my top five of you know top five favorite movies of all time. I just I I was just blown away by this movie. I I just uh, I immediately after I watched it, I wanted to watch it again. I was like, this is awesome. And it's so like again, it's got all of those great, you know. It's a, it's definitely a great monster movie, but it's so unbelievably cheesy. It's got you know such a low budget, but it's still it's still got this essence of of a horror movie, and it's got this great atmosphere. And the ending is just awesome. The last battle between Frankenstein and Dracula is just super badass. Like it's just awesome. And again, this is Severn. Severn is. You know, I think there's so many great companies around, but Severin, I think, is hands down the best one, just because of they they go as as far as a company that that's like specializing in releasing these you know exploitation movies. They they go that extra mile and put a lot of love and care into their packages. And I mean, just look at this thing. So so I highly recommend 1971. It's it's mind boggling how 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 old this film is and how long ago it came out so definitely check it out it's amazing you'll be a fan so this is jason dean i'm going to sign off here and thanks again for everyone's support if you like this channel please like and subscribe to it and uh, we will see you next time enjoy your day peace